Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning, evening, or afternoon, depending on where you are around the world. Uh, we're going to take one more minute to allow people that will arrive on time to join us. We already have people who are waiting, uh, so I appreciate your patience and your poorness on timeness, and we'll start very soon. Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for joining us for this exciting session of Practitest webinar series. Today we're going to host uh, Lisa, which I, I, I myself have heard so much about but haven't had the opportunity to meet in person, so I'm personally excited and I hope you are likewise. I can share that we have, we do those webinars on a monthly basis. Uh, by the way, I'll start reverse. Sorry, my name is Noah. Hi, I'm heading the marketing here at Practitest. We're very happy to have Lisa with us today and to have all of you. I can share behind the scenes that this is one of the webinars that we saw. Um, we saw many people interested. Uh, so it looks like I'm not the only one who is excited. Before I hand over to Lisa, I'd like to take very few, a short moment uh, just to say a little a few words about Practitest for those of you who haven't, met, haven't heard of us before. I know there are some people, uh, this is the first encounter, so I want to take the opportunity uh, so a little bit about us on what we do. Practitest is a test management solution. We are a centralized testing hub that's connecting any type of testing, okay, all the way from providing full visibility, all the way from requirements into test and test execution to issues and integration with any type of tool that you're working with. Uh, we work with some of the world's largest enterprise organization. As, as such, we hold any relevant certification and love by users. I have a lot of batch here to show that, uh, but... It's cute. A little bit more about ourselves. We have founded the company back in 2008. We've been around for quite some time. Uh, but essentially, what we're trying to do is to untangle complexity. Testing has become more complex than what it used to be. Uh, I think Lisa can address to that. Uh, that some have some things have remained the same, but a lot of change over the years. Uh, and we are aiming to assist our customers in, in providing control via orchestration of any testing practice tools and teams. Those are scattered in many, many cases. Provide superior QA intelligence via smart and sophisticated reports and dashboard and allow testers and teams to redefine what QA excellence really means. So that's a little bit about what we do. Some of our customers, you can find some of the brands you know across the world throughout basically any industry. I don't need to tell testers this, but testing now has become any company task. And we see that from the broad of our customers. And one last thing that I do want to invite you is that we host regular training sessions uh, that you are more than welcome to sign up and join. And of course, you can always reply to my email with the recording of the session. Those of you who can attend, we are always sharing the recording. And if you want to schedule a dedicated demo of your own, we will be more than happy to provide that. And without further ado, uh, this one was already done, but you can always, as I mentioned, this is a glitch, bad QA from my end. Uh, but one of the activities that we are doing, we are hosting for the past 10 years, the state of testing survey. In case you haven't heard of last month, we had a webinar that's sharing the results, but you can access our website, our resource center, you can access the result and read the full report. Uh, tons and tons of interest, interesting stats. If you if you haven't filled it, we invite you always to be part of, part of our community who fill in it for next year, but also read the report. I think there's some interesting insights there. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing, hand over to Lisa, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Let me get my screen shared here. Can everybody see that okay? Yep. All right. Um, I just have to... 
Well, okay, great. Sorry, I had a little technical issue there. Uh, thank you for for having me. No, I uh, I go way back with the lovely people from Practice Test, and have participated in quite a few events over the years, and I always enjoy it a lot and always learn a lot. Uh, so, and thanks to Practice Test for all their contributions to our testing community. Really appreciate it. So today we're going to talk about cognitive bias and testing, and I have learned a lot working with people like Stephanie Desby and Rachel Kibler uh, to put this material together. Um, if you ever find yourself in Vermont, uh, USA, come by and meet the donkeys. Uh, always, always happy to, to see people. Um, and Janet, Gregory, and I have done a lot of work together over the years, and, and I've done a little bit on my own as well. But go to my website for all the links that you need for anything that we've done. And please get in touch with me on LinkedIn, on by email. I'm always happy to talk about testing. So don't hesitate. So today, I just want to assure you there's no special prerequisite knowledge required. Um, we're going to play some games. You already know everything you need to do to, 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 do the, to, to join in. It's an experiment. And all questions are good questions. So I'll try to leave a lot of time at the end. Uh, I want to enable you to learn about biases and see what might help you in your work. So as with any learning experience uh, that we're remote and you're in your office or at home, be sure you have something with you to drink, stay hydrated, have some paper so you can doodle. And if you need to get up and move around, hopefully you can still listen and watch. Uh, that's always good to help your brain learn. So when you hear the words think outside the box or when you saw the title to this webinar, what did what did you think about? What does that mean to you? Um, is it something it, something you like to do yourself? So let's look at some, ex think of some examples. Um, what are some inventions or discoveries that you think were made because someone was thinking outside the box? I'm just going to give you a minute to ruminate on that. And if you want to share in the chat, feel free. I'm not going to look at the chat because I'll probably get too distracted. Uh, but I'd love you to share with each other. What are some some thoughts that you have of what were some good discoveries where somebody was going against what most people believed? Any thoughts there? Well, here's just a couple. Uh, you know, a navigator back in 1492 said, oh, let's go the other way to discover the path to the east and the spice trade. Uh, and look what happened. Discovered a whole new continent. Uh, Steve Jobs. I don't think we have to have a keyboard. <laughs> this was a shocking thing back in 2008. Is that when the iPhone came out? So I expect this is probably something that you do already. A lot, a lot of you watching, I'm guessing you're testers, and so you really need to think outside the box to do that. So it's exciting to think about what this kind of thinking can do. <laughs> Excuse me. So if it's so great, why don't we do it all the time? Because let's face it, we don't do it all the time. We're also often thinking in a different way. So. Let's look into that some more. So some of you may already know what lateral and vertical thinking are. Lateral thinking is another term for thinking outside the box. So vertical thinking is a type of logical problem solving we all do. Very conscious step-by-step -step approach, relying on data, relying on facts. And, you know, it's a good, it's a really a good way to work. Um, Lateral thinking is a problem solving with a more indirect and creative approach. It's reasoning that's not immediately obvious. You can't get there with step-by-step -step log logical thinking. So this term, these terms were coined by Edward de Bono back in 1967. And he noticed that this kind of thinking, at least it surprises, at least a different thought pattern. Sometimes it makes us laugh because it, 
just wasn't what we expected. Uh, so that's, that's the uh, idea behind it. And many of you have probably read this book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, who sadly passed away at the age of 90, I believe, last month. Um, it's just a, it's a kind of a go-to book for a lot of testers because he talks about these two modes of thinking. So I like to learn by examples. So we're gonna go through some quick game, a quick game uh, to help you see the difference between auto automatic thinking and uh, the system one type thinking that Daniel talks about in his book. So you'll have one second to answer, just you know, write down your answer. Don't, don't, don't share it, you won't have time. So, so get ready, I'm gonna go through these pretty fast. What's the capital of England? What animal is this? What emotion does this person feel? What is 17 times 24? Uh, you probably have to stop and think about that one a little bit. So our brains have these two kinds of thinking that Kahneman talks about in his book. And our brain is wired to go on automatic mode. So that's the system one thinking. That's from evolution, right? Back in the day when People were living in caves and if a mammoth started to chase you, you didn't have time to think about, hmm, I wonder if I need to run, what's that mammoth gonna do? Your brain just said, run, let's go. And there are parts of your brain, you know, that your lizard brain that just tells you to do this. And that's good, it saves you. That's something we have to use a lot just to live day to day. Um, you know, think about those of you who drive cars, Think about your first driving lessons. You had to really think about every little move you made. But now, if you're an experienced driver, you might drive. So I know I do this. I'll drive somewhere that I drive to all the time and kind of think, oh, I was kind of spaced out. I'm not even sure like how I got here. Um, so in order to survive, you know, the brain just makes deductions and shortcuts. And we need to do this a lot of times in software development, you know, testing a, a login screen. Well, we make, can make a lot of assumptions about that that are safe to make and it helps us speed up. However, these shortcuts can lead to a distortion of reality. So we have to be careful. So um, I'm sure that a lot of you already know a lot of cognitive biases. Um, you know, it's a systematic pattern of deviation from the norm or rationality and judgment. So it's where you create your own subjective social reality from your perception of the input. Uh, and it's not objective, it's not necessarily based on facts. You may think it is, but it's not. And it might affect your behavior. So let's look at some of these. So let's get into some individual cognitive biases. So what line, that line on the left, when you look at the three lines on the right, which one matches the length of the first line? And I, I would encourage y'all to participate because you're gonna learn from each other as well as learning from me. So don't be shy about putting your answers in here. Uh, it's more exciting than just listening to me talk, but I, I don't see anybody chatting. Maybe you are. Um, so this might look pretty obvious. It doesn't look difficult to pick what line it is. However, Solomon Ash conducted a study where he showed groups of people these lines and he planted people in the audience who purposely shouted out the wrong answer. Um, and he did this repeatedly with a bunch of different groups of people. And he found that every time a lot of people in the room would conform to the planted people and their wrong answer, even though it was obviously a wrong answer, sometimes up to three quarters of the people on the root in the room. So that seems pretty crazy, but we're humans and we act in funny ways. That was probably something back in our evolution. If we went, if we went along with the crowd, that was safer than being out by ourselves. Right? So there's probably a rational ex explanation if you look at our evolution. But uh, yeah, he looked into this a lot and it was really surprising results. 
So we call this conformity bias. A little sheep for illustration. Sheep tend to do this. Um, so it's adjusting one's behavior or thinking to match those of other people or group standard. And there's a really fun video. I'm not going to show it here, but I, I will share my slides. I don't, I'm, I'll give them to practice tests and anybody can contact me. I can give you the slides. But, um, but this URL has a really unbelievable and hilarious video that shows you how crazy we humans are when we're sub subjected to our unconscious bias. Lisa, I'm pausing you for a sec. Someone wrote to me on the chat that there is a technical challenge that the chat is not disabled, which we're working on fixing right now. So just so you understand, people are not. Oh, they are I did not realize. Just, Darn. They are okay. responding, but just not. You can see that at the moment. Uh, fix is on the way. Sorry. About okay. That. Uh, okay. Well, hopefully that'll get fixed. I did tell them up front I was going to use the chat, but yeah, we had some technical glitch here. Uh, all right. So, um, so conformity bias. So think about how this might affect your team. Let's say you're all discussing a story with maybe with your product owner and maybe the designer. Uh, maybe somebody in the room has more influence and the whole team goes along with them and falls into a group thing sort of thing. Uh, and as a result, you miss a big risk or some necessary piece of functionality so that you get this new feature out in production and it's not right. Uh, that's going to, that happens a lot. So it's something we want to make sure that we can avoid. So let's look at a different bias. I'm just going to work through a few of them. So um, what rule produces this series? And I don't know if the chat's working yet. <laughs> It'd be helpful if it was. Uh, I'm just going to wait for a minute and let you think about it. Just Write it down for yourself if, if the chat's not working. So what do you think? Well, I suggest maybe write it down in the meantime in the Q&A because that one does work. Until okay. <laughs> Apologies. Okay. Well, a couple of people are writing in the Q&A. I'll see if I can look at the Q&A without losing my mind. Add the previous two values. Any other thoughts? But that one, that one does work. It would answer the question. Rule of even numbers sequentially. Okay. Well, this is one that you couldn't crack unless you had the chance to ask me questions. And so it shows the value of asking questions. So the rule I wanted was a series of three numbers that are two numbers apart, positive or negative. So we could also, I could also have shown one, three, one, three, five, seven, negative one, zero, two. There's, there's no way you could know that, but your brain saw a pattern and you came up with an answer that was completely rational. Uh, nothing wrong with your answers, but you just don't have enough evidence to do more. But but we did we did a lot rely on patterns, especially I think in, as testers we rely on seeing patterns. Uh, so not wrong to do that answer. But but excuse me, it shows the value of questions, and you know when people say they're a QA, I think they're a question asker. It's what we're really great at. So that's called confirmation bias. We see what we expect to see. So here's the definition from probably from Wikipedia. Um, and I have run into this so many times in my teams. So we're working on a, we're working on a new change, maybe to a change to our user interface. And the developers tested it. A tester has tested it. The product owner has given it the go ahead. We put it in production and the customers immediately contact us. And there's some horrible glaring error that none of us saw because it was in another part of the screen than what we changed. And we didn't realize we'd broken it. We saw what we expected to see. And that happens to me more times than I can tell you. Um, so that's a dangerous one. Uh, and it affects us in a lot of aspects of life. Um, you know, 
I catch myself doing that all the time. It's like, I'm really mad about some issue and I go looking on the internet and I'm like, yeah, here's a study that backs up what I say. Maybe that's the right study and maybe it's not, uh, but I like it and I don't look any further. And, you know, can affect this in our interpersonal relationships at all as well, which is really important as we work on in software delivery. We have to have good relationships with lots and lots of people. I'll give you some time to read that. And let's move on to the next bias. Now the chat should work. So you Oh, great. You okay. Invited, you're invited to test it live. Just in time. I'm going to see if I can watch the chat without making myself crazy. Um, all right. So I just want you to compute in your head. Don't cheat and use a calculator. Uh, the product of these numbers, and, I, and I'll give you, I'm going to time you. I'll give you five seconds for that. Don't type it in the chat, though, yet. All right. Now, compute in your head the product of these numbers in five seconds. Don't type it in the chat yet. All right. So feel free to share your answers in the chat. What did you come up with? Um, well, I kind of gave away the answer too early. I should have said on that last slide. Uh, this is another study from Daniel Kahneman with Amos Tversky. When the first people multiply the first one with starting with the low numbers, it's one times two is two, two times three is six. They come up with a lower guess. When they start with the higher numbers, boy, that number adds up pretty fast. So they come up with a higher guess. And the correct answer is 40,000 and something. Pretty amazing. Um, so what is this? It's anchoring bias. And this affects us, again, in so, so many ways. Um, whatever reference point you start with, it's going to influence you. Even as you get more information, your brain is hooked on to that initial impression. The original anchor has the most influence. So let's say we're doing Scrum and we're doing an estimating meeting and we estimate a story and somebody, a couple people will say eight points. Uh, and it's like, well, you had a difference of opinion. Some people said one or two. Well, when you do it again, people are going to move towards that higher number because they're affected by that. Um, the sprint length in Scrum, a lot of people do a two-week sprint. We get in the habit of organizing our work, so it's always going to fit to this two-week sprint, even though maybe we could have delivered more frequently than that or done done more things sooner or certainly finished our testing sooner. Uh, so this can really get in our way. Um, so, yeah. So this is called, well, yeah, let's go, let's move on to another cognitive bias. All right, uh, again, don't share in the chat yet, but I want you to take a minute and think of all the words you can think of that start with letter K. And hopefully those of you who English isn't your first language still have words that start with K. <laughs> it's hard to do this for an international audience. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, now think of all the words you can think of that have K as the third letter in the word. I'll give you a little bit of time, the same amount of time to try to think of those. So how many th did you think of that start with K? And how many did you think of that K is a third letter? Uh, I would love it if anybody could share this in the chat. So I'm curious what you came up with. I know what the 
I know what the, uh... oh, you know, my chat only shows hosts and panelists. It doesn't show everybody. Uh, updated just now again. So let's try one more time. Apologies. Because in the definition, it I show you, I see anyone. So if you can try one more time. Oh, oh yeah. I see. I, I do see people, even though it says host and panelists. Okay. So Johan got 10 started with K and through the K is a third letter. Anybody else want to share? Yay, it's working. Any other thoughts of how many did you find? Much fewer with the third letter of K. Ah, because we alphabetized using the first letter, not the third. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense, Daniel. All right. So this is another study that's been done by Tversky and Kahneman. Um, and so even though the, in the English language, there are a lot more words with K as the third letter. Yeah, as you say, our brains, we think of K as the first letter. It's the easiest to remember. It's easier to think of words that begin with K. So we think of more. Um, so it's it's related to anchoring bias that we just talked about, but it is a little bit different. So we call this availability bias or uh, Kahneman called it availability heuristic. So you'll hear both terms, but they mean the same thing. <clears throat> so it's a mental shortcut. It relies on the immediate examples that come to mind. And again, th this is how we function day to day and do our work. We, ha we can't stop and think about every little thing. So. It most of the time, this serves us well, but it can get us into trouble. Um, this isn't a well understood cognitive bias. It's very difficult to study, um, but it's something to be aware of. And where we see it in our daily lives, um, shark attacks, those are always overreported. People are afraid of sharks when they don't need to be. Lottery commercials will show us people winning and throwing all this money around so that we think we have a better likelihood of winning. And um, cars, I once bought a yellow car and was so surprised, like all of a sudden I saw nothing but yellow cars. Uh, so you never saw it before, but once you've seen it, you see it over and over again. So that's availability bias. So, these biases can affect software quality in a whole lot of ways. And I'm not gonna go through all of them in detail, but we have from Kahneman and Tversky, loss aversion. What does that affect us as test as software teams? Well, one thing it does is make us keep tests around that we don't need or are causing us too much time to maintain them. Maybe they're flaky, but we just, we might pen them or comment them out, but we just can't get rid of them. Um, and Joao Prince has a great talk on this. I've got a link to that in my resources slide. Maybe we had a production problem once. It was so rare. It was just the stars aligned. It's never going to happen again. But we're so paranoid about it. We keep focusing our testing on that. But we're ignoring more important things. Sunk cost syndrome, or some people call this the Concord syndrome. We stick with a test tool uh, or test framework, like an automated test framework because we've been using it for years and we have thousands and thousands of tests. So we don't want to switch. It just seems too hard. We've got so much invested in it. The Ikea effect. Ikea learned that consumers place a disproportionately high value on products that they partially created. We see this a lot of places like add an egg and some water to a cake mix. Um, that's not always the best approach for software teams. It might be fun to build things ourselves, but it increases our cognitive load. So if we can pay somebody else to do it or buy a product that does it for us, that meets our needs, that we didn't have to build ourselves, we can focus on improving our own product. Functional fixedness keeps us from seeing alternative solutions. Like we're so set on, we know how our product works and that's how we test it. And that's what we expect customers to do. I'm sure you've all experienced Experience that customers might do something completely different. And we can't be in denial about that, but there's just a mental block to seeing something any other way than what we're used to. So how do we start thinking laterally when it would help us improve our product quality and get us out of these traps? We wanna use 
the automatic thinking when it's appropriate, how do we switch to the more thoughtful lateral mode when we need to? We're gonna try one more exercise and I really hope that you'll think about this one because it's a fun one. I see somebody's raising a hand, but I'm not sure what to do about that. I allow them to speak if they want to. So it's- Oh, okay, that's easy. fine. Go ahead, sir, sir, he. Did you want to say something? It's open for whenever. So it's, um, I think you can go on and I, I enable them so they, they can, they can if they want. Okay, well, I don't mind stopping for questions, especially if there's something I said that you didn't understand, because I hate for you to spend the rest of the time wondering. Or just type it in the chat. Okay, so we're going to play this game. And I want you to write your ideas down, but don't share them in the chat yet. So, how would you test a soda machine? And I'm just going to give you a little time to... Think about how you might do that. Just write down your ideas. I'm sure we're going to get some good ideas. Okay, I know that wasn't a lot of time, but I'm sure some, some of you have thought of ideas. Now, I would like you to share your ideas in the chat, if you don't mind. I'd like to see what people came up with. So feel free to type out some of the scenarios you would do when testing a soda machine. And remember, there are no bad ideas, there are no wrong answers. Okay, Johan, try to push the glass to the start mechanism, okay? And really push it hard, yeah. Other ideas. Ooh, measure the temperature, okay? Oh, Y'all are some thoughtful testers. Anyone else? I know it takes a while to type this in. Or you can shout them out if you want to unmute and shout them out. Sounds like a, that was doable. <gasps> Eric has a the really terrific question. What do you mean by soda machine? What kind of soda machine? What did people think of when they thought about a soda machine? The Daniel and Johan are clearly talking about the ones where you put your cup in ice and soda come out. Make sure servers are correct. Okay, so again, that sounds like the kind you go and... Oh, here we go. Yes. Are there different kinds of machines? Okay, so y'all have some great... Ashley has a bunch of great ideas there. So when we've done this with uh, with other groups and workshops, we find that people have a lot of different ideas when I say soda machine. So some people think of a vending machine, some people think of a seltzer machine, and some people think of the one y'all were thinking about where you go get a cup of a drink. And they're all valid, they're all soda machines. I don't know, in different languages, maybe they're not, but definitely in English, I've had all three of these. Uh, that's where, where people thought of those. So again, as uh, as Eric notes, it's important to ask questions. Um, and this is why it's good to have the group share their ideas. So brainstorming, science tells us that brainstorming works best when you start out by having people write their individual ideas. So don't be disturbed by others or be influenced by others. Just write your ideas down on sticky notes or whatever. Then bring the group together and you're going to notice things like, oh, we had a hidden assumption here of what a soda machine was. Um, 
that happens in the software as well. We all had our own thought about how this should work. And that gives us great conversations about, well, what do we think it should be or do? Uh, we don't want to have hidden assumptions. So it's really important to do these kinds of brainstorming things. This is something I highly recommend you do with your own team. It's fun. It doesn't take long. And it really shows that you can have um, unconscious bias that is going to trip you up if you're not talking to each other. So it's a, it's a fun, quick exercise to do. It, if soda machine doesn't work in your context, think of something else that could have people could interpret that term differently. So this is a reason to collaborate. Again, we want to think of ideas on our own. That's important. But we want to share those ideas with other people and then work together because there are things that we can't prevent on our own because of our unconscious biases. So people are always saying, well, just be aware of your unconscious bias. It's unconscious. It's good to be aware that you have them. But on a daily basis, they're just going to happen in your brain. Uh, individually, you're not going to prevent them. Um, so knowing you have them is a good thing, but it's not going to keep them from kicking in. Now, my own experience over the years is that practices like pairing, especially pairing with somebody who's got another specialty, like I'm a tester pairing with a developer or a designer or a customer support person, or even better, working in an ensemble, a small group of people in different roles with different specialties with diverse skill sets, diverse backgrounds, diverse experience. That helps. I have not been able to find any scientific studies that back me up on this, but experientially, uh, I have seen it work. My theory, my unscientific theory is that hopefully we each have different cognitive biases. They, we're all wired a little bit differently. So something that I miss, you know, Noah might see. And when she sees that, I see, oh, so that makes me see something else that she didn't see. So it really, really does work. Um, so collaboration and diversity is one really important thing. Um. And, and again, collaborating together real time using, if you were in person, using whiteboards and sticky notes. If we're virtual, using the mirror boards and things like that. Um, talking with our product owners, our stakeholders to get concrete examples of how a new feature or a new piece of functionality should behave that we can turn into tests. Practices like example mapping, one of my favorites. Uh, I was on a team where we had our iteration planning meetings and we all thought we understood every story and we work hard on it and did a great job and delivered it to the product owner and the product owner would say, that's not what I wanted at all. Um, and so we're like, why does this keep happening? We tried example mapping, a practice from Matt Wynn, where we get the business rules and for each business rule, we get concrete examples of, of how that rule works. And we cut our rejection rate in half in just a couple of weeks. It's awesome. So our brains work really well when we use our hands for something uh, and when we draw together. Communication is quite enhanced just by two people drawing on a whiteboard. It's much better than two people talking. Um, using the brainstorming techniques like what we use for the soda machine. Risk storming. I don't know if you've heard of risk storming, but any kind of risk assessment where you focus on a few quality attributes and think about what risks might happen and how you might mitigate those risks. Those conversations are so important and they help us overcome our biases. I'm a big fan of visual models. Um, you know, back in the early aughts, uh, I was working on a team and our our uh, manager was Mike Cohn, who's the who originated the test automation pyramid. And it was when he first thought of it, it was back in 2003. And we were struggling. We had no automation. And we were like, how do we even get traction with this? And he brought out this pyramid and it really helped us have conversations of, oh, okay, well, we could test this at the unit level. Let's try to do as much as we can at the unit level. Oh, we do need UI tests. And it just helped us come up with a strategy because we had a visual model. So these are some of the models that Janet, Gregory, and I uh, have found really useful. And we've got a lot of feedback. They're useful. But there are tons of it. Draw your own model. Just use a visual 
to help your team think outside the box, it really does have a, a wor an effect. Um, well, I already talked about concrete examples. I repeated myself a little bit there. So if you want to dive more into brainstorming techniques, these are a few you can look up that work really, really well. Um, so, you know, try some out with your team, see what works best. They go really fast, they're fun, and they're going to really get you thinking outside your box. Personas, a lot of you may already use personas for exploratory testing and things like that. Those are really good ways to get over that functional fixedness that, oh, we know how this should behave and we don't think about other ways a customer might use it. So those personas are really important. You know, how would an evil hacker use it? How would a mom holding a baby in her arm use it? Those kind of things. So, I've given you some quick examples of how your team can collaborate together to think outside the box. And I've got a lot more uh, things on my resources slide. And like I say, I'm happy to share the slides. Um, so, so again, these are just some resources, so some talks by Joao Prinza that were, those really helped me. Uh, I really raised my consciousness about it, <laughs> no pun intended. Mike Brinkhoff has a whole series on Ministry of Testing on Cognitive Bias and Software Testing. Goes much more in depth than mine. Uh, Risk Storming uh, is a great, oh, I, I forgot the dot com on that. Somebody should have tested these slides. Um, example mapping. And then if you look at Janet's and my blogs, we've got lots and lots of information and on our websites as well. So. You can look around there in our books, of course, we have a lot of ideas as well. Now, I didn't get into the bias and generative AI tools. That's a whole different subject, but it's another one you should think about. Uh, and ping me for resources on that if you're curious. All right, so that's all I have. Uh, hopefully we still have some time for questions. I will stop sharing my slide. Okay, I have uh, one question that was written here. Uh, people would prefer not to say, speak out loud, so I'll read it out. You can write in the chat or in the Q&A if you prefer, uh, and I can read it for you. But the first question was, would it help to remind ourselves at every planning meeting and testing session to be aware of our conscious biases? Will that be sufficient, do you think? Oh, I mean, I wouldn't hurt to say that, but I think more important, you might say, what will we do today to help us overcome our conscious biases. And it might be, let's start drawing a flow diagram on the whiteboard, or let's use some sticky notes and brainstorm a little bit. So think of some technique that might help you um, compensate for those biases. Just having all those people in the room is, is gonna help. It's worse when you're on your own. <laughs> Thank you. And another one uh, for me is that, do you think there is a specific time, well, if we're talking specifically in the context of testing, right? And we're testing a new feature, which is something that many people here are familiar with. When is the best time to try to think outside of the box? Obviously you can say always, but if there is limitation, and as you mentioned, we used to automatic thinking. So what time specifically is the best time to do that? Um, I think there are a few times where it's really important. So in these early planning stages where the product owner or business stakeholder has brought us, like, here's a new feature, and we're going to slice that feature into stories, that's the time to really start asking good questions, use maybe a technique like risk storming to think about the risks. Um, my last job, I'm a big fan of risk storming, but it when you have to do it online, it takes a while, and they wouldn't take the time. So I made my own 30 minute version, I called it quick risk strategizing. And we just use a Google Jamboard and color coded um, post-it notes to think about risk and what we needed to test. And I had some prompts of some dimensions of quality and quality attributes to think about. And in 30 minutes, we really thought of a lot that could trip us up and it really helped us as a team put together a really effective test strategy. And everybody is willing to spend 30 minutes for that. So, um, so that's an important time to do it. And then I think um, when we're building our software, well, even before we build our software, we also should think about how we're gonna 
keep track of it in production. So what data do we need to capture in our log files and things like that? So we have monitoring and observability and then exploratory testing. This is a big time. We really need to use personas and use other techniques to think what could customers possibly do? What scenarios could come up that we're not, we don't expect and try to flush out those problems before they become unknown unknowns that bite us in production. So th those are really important times to brainstorm and use these techniques. Thank you. We have uh, two more questions. Uh, I'll, I'll read them reverse, in reverse order. The first one, uh, McKinsey is asking, do you think using formats like BDD, even when then, uh, helps to get rid of unconscious bias that so help recognize teams are assuming certain things or that they actually encourage this? Um, that's a good point. I think it does because it really distills your thought process of what are the prerequisites, what has to be in place before we do this behavior, and then what is the behavior we're going to do, and what do we expect to happen? So I think that is a good framework. And because you should be creating these test uh, scenarios together with you know a tester working with a developer working with a, and working with a product owner ideally at least three different roles you're going to have those great conversations so it is a great framework uh to make sure that you have that great shared understanding that's a that's a really good point and and the last one uh before we wrap up uh, because we can, I think we can have any session nowadays without talking about AI. And thank you, Daniel, for raising it up. Uh, is the fact that the question about the fact that AI is typically trained uh, on human generated material. So you think AI also display cognitive biases? AI has horrible biases. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't necessarily call them cognitive biases because AI is not th doesn't know anything and it can't think. But we're training it on data and the data may be biased in itself. That's so common. It happens so much. And we also know that the generative AI tools will just make things up as well, sure. depending on how you're prompting it. And so it's a huge danger with those. And I think coupled with our own cognitive bias, we could be in real trouble. There are wonderful tools. We need to have them in our toolbox. We need to know how to use them, but we need to be aware of uh, the potential biases. And, and there are ways to test for that. So I think as testers, we can use our critical thinking to test these tools and see what their limitations are. And if we're creating our own large language models, we need to really collaborate and try to overcome our own bias to, to find good data sets to train them on that will be straightforward. Thank you for this. I'll add one more sentence, not from you, but I'll share. We just had a fireside chat uh, with Anne Romley from Salesloft. And we asked, like we asked everyone uh, about her pitch about AI. And I think that, as she mentioned, AI still has a lot. And one of the questions that we asked was about whether we think AI will replace testers. Okay. And she had a strong no for that in the very near future, uh, which I 100% agree. And I'll say that I think that somewhat in, in the near future, one of the important roles testers will have, speaking of thinking outside the box, is to test AI assumption and to test because it's so easy just to generate, you know, in a click of a button, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit more marketing promotion here for Practitest. But with Practitest and with any other tool, you know, with a click of a button, you, you put a description, you put a test name, and then you have a test set. You have steps created automatically by Gen AI. But then you have to have a person that validates those results, that tests them, that corrects them, that assess them. Uh, and that I think personally that a lot of our upcoming future will be around those areas. It's just a, it's going to be a different type of testing, but validating, actually correcting assumptions that was made by the machine uh, and teaching it and training it will be, I think, something that we will find ourselves doing quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole new career path there for people who have testing skills. And, and you know, it's not going to take our jobs. We may have trouble getting jobs if we refuse to learn how to use those tools. Absolutely. 100% <laughs> agree. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this session. I personally learned a lot and enjoyed it. Uh, with the amount of people that join us, I think I'm...
speaking not just myself, uh, but thank you for the very educational session. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will be sharing the recording so you can watch the slides again. Uh, comment yourself on the chat on the parts that were that were that were not tested before, but in case you want to, uh, and feel free. I would repeat what Lisa said to reach out to her uh, through the channels that she mentioned to practice test if you have questions. And we are looking forward to seeing you in our upcoming webinar next month. And thank you all again for being with us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining in, everybody.